You gotta change your habits or change your goals. Muay Thai is 50% running and 30% laundry. Keep working on your game. Keep innovating. I'm always winning. So what is your pro tip? Hello and welcome to Pro Tip Conversations. Today's guest is someone whose YouTube channel I've been following keenly for a few years now. Growing up in the Northern Territory in Australia, he's someone who played professionally for Middlesex in England and then went on to establish the cricket mentoring program in Perth with students now all over the world. As a competitive cricketer, I've watched and gained valuable insights just listening to him work with his students. I love how he communicates with his students and challenges them to become great problem solvers uh, in their own batting. Uh, his philosophy of the four R's, we'll touch upon it a little bit later, is something I try to practice every time I hit the nets uh, and in games. Um, in his book, he says that he try, he's trying to be the mentor he wishes he had. Um, having watched his channel, I will add that, you know, I feel like if I had him as a mentor in 2007, 2008, maybe my career might have gone a little bit different in, in cricket uh, at a higher level. Um, I'm excited to chat with him today and hear about his journey and also talk to him about his coaching philosophy. Without further ado, welcome Tom Scully uh, to Pro Tip Conversations. Hi Anish, thanks for having me mate. Really excited to be here and, and chat cricket and coaching and everything else. Absolutely. And yeah, first off, Scholes, if I may call you that, um, thank you for putting Cricket Mentoring out into the world. It has been an invaluable resource for me and my friends and other people that I've spoken to. Uh, I think coaches and mentors uh, such as yourself, sharing your hard-earned insights is a gift to all of us. Um, that knowledge share and connection is precisely what the founding vision for ProTip was. So I'm incredibly excited to be able to pick your brains and hopefully put a few more nuggets out into the world for people to find. Uh, so yeah, yeah, thanks once again. My pleasure, mate. Thank you. And it's, um, it's great to, it's great to hear that. I, um, yeah, social media is such an amazing thing where I can create content and put it online and then you just don't know who it reaches and, and who's benefiting from it. But fortunately we have had some amazing feedback over the years and, and I'm really, yeah, really grateful to be able to share sort of my learnings, my failures and all the things in between, um, with, with whoever's willing to listen and, and learn themselves. Yeah, it's fantastic. Thanks. Um, so I guess for today, you know, we'll start at the very beginning of your journey. Um, and we'll go with how did you get started in cricket? Mate, I, I played soccer when I was young as my first sport and then had tennis lessons and my mum and dad got me into a few different things. Um, but it wasn't until I was about nine or 10, maybe 10, that a friend of mine in primary school was playing cricket and I used to sort of sleep over his house on a Friday night and I'd go along and watch and I started to get really interested that I'd, I'd sort of asked to sleep over his house again. I'd bring my white clothes and I think for a couple of weeks I got the field and then <laughs> I think um, <clears throat> my parents worked out what was going on and they said, do you want to play? There was a spot in the team and I've, my, I've got a twin brother. My twin brother and I, he was probably not that keen, but they signed us both up as they do with twins and... Um, <laughs> I think my first ball I faced in a competitive match, I think I got this juicy full toss and I hit it for four. And I think I became oh, addicted. <laughs> to, I think I became addicted to the game. And, and I think I, I played the second half of that season in Canberra where we were living and I won the coaches award or the batting award or something. And I just, I don't know, something about it. I kept continuing to play soccer for a few more years, but cricket was on TV. I was watching it a lot in the summer and it became, yeah, this huge part of my life and has been ever since I was 10 years old. So yeah, I've got a lot of sort of, I suppose I've got my mate in Canberra to thank um, for, for sort of getting me into it at the very start. Awesome. And then from there, I guess, did you go on to represent school, your school team? And can you tell us a little bit about your path to going pro with Middlesex? Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll yeah, that's a sort of a 12 year journey, I guess, from 12 to from 10 to 22. But we'll try and keep it pretty brief. So I moved back to Alice Springs. I, I sort of played in a, a local team there. And then I think I got picked in a sort of an un Alice Springs under 13 team. And um, Alice Springs is a small town in the middle of Australia, in the Northern Territory, a town of 30,000 people. And it's it's far more renowned for producing football players. Indigenous, a lot of Indigenous players come out of there and go on and play Australian rules football. Um, but I got picked in this representative team. My parents were sort of arm and about whether I'd play because it was a little bit costly. Um, anyway, my brother and I, he got picked as well. We both played and I did pretty well. Um, I got picked for the Northern Territory under 13 team and then I went away to a carnival. Um, and then sort of I just kept practicing and trying to get better and, and sort of learning for, uh, myself. I didn't have any private coaching or any mentors. I didn't, my father didn't play. I didn't have... I had some senior players um, at the cricket club I was at that would help and be great. 
Um, but I got into the Northern Territory system. I was in there under 15 system as a sort of 13-year-old and played a few years in that level. I got in there under 17s and played a number of years there. I captained there under 17s. I got in the under 19s. I had four years in the under 19s and captain that age group. And I just, the older I got, the more I loved it, the more time and effort I put into it. In our off season, I'd go up to Darwin, the capital of the Northern Territory, and I'd I'd spend four weeks up there in the school holidays. And then one year I spent six months up there when I was in year 11 as a 16 year old. And I just, I just started, I just kept getting better because I was putting so much time and effort into it. And, and one of the big things I I teach and, and preach when I, I do talks to, to groups is that if you have a real love for your craft and what you do, well, that that is the, the secret source that takes you a long way in this game. And I I think I had and still have a love for the, for cricket, um, for the game, for the intricacies, the challenges, etc. So I, I would always be practising. And so I just, I was never a sort of a, I was a, a big fish in a small pond, as my mum used to say, in, in a small town. Um then when I was 18, I moved to Perth to pursue my dreams um, to play for Australia. I got into university. I deferred university to try and play more cricket. I would spend six months in Perth. I think I did eight years straight. I did six months in Perth, six months in Darwin, six months in Perth, six months in Darwin, Wow. season in Perth. And then I went to England and I had six seasons in England. So I was playing all year round pretty much with a few weeks off in between seasons. Um, and that experience um, just kept making me better. The more I'd play, the better I'd get. Um and so in, in 2008, I first went to England. In 2010, in my third season over there, I, uh, sorry, end of 2009, I got a trial with Middlesex at the very end of the season, my second year in England. And, um, I, yeah, I did well. I got 60-odd. I got 66 off 33 balls in a, in a 50, sort of a reduced, rain-reduced 50-over game. It was a 26-over game, and I just I hit 24 off the first over. I whacked them, and... <laughs> Middlesex then invited me to come back the next year and, and trial properly. So I came back in 2010. I, I played with their second team for a few months, did well, and, and then got offered a, a contract for two and a half years. So, look, that's a, a three-minute version of 12 years um, <laughs> where I was just playing lots and lots and lots of cricket, trying to practice most days, but no one was forcing me to do it. I had no real coaches, no real mentors. I had some people that I'd see from the, from Darwin would come down or I'd go up there and I had a few people here and there, but no one on a regular basis. It was, I had very supportive parents, um, but I was sort of a bit on my own. And, and that is where, as you say, I'm, I'm now trying to be the mentor I wish I had. I'm trying to fill a gap that I wish I, I sort of, I lacked, I guess. And, and I'm really proud that I did get to where I got to, but I do also think that had I known a few more things about myself and about like my mind, as you, as you mentioned, like my mind and my emotions, I think maybe I would have still be playing. Maybe I'd still have a professional career. Maybe I would have done a lot more in the game. But through my shortcomings and my struggles, I'm now trying to be the mentor I wish I had and help others reach their full potential and get the most out of themselves. So, yeah, look, I don't know if you want to unpack it anymore, but there's a, a brief sort of history of how I progressed to be a professional. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's pretty incredible that, uh, you know, at a young age, you kind of knew that this is what you wanted to make uh, your career from, right? Like, because you spent, six, you mentioned six months in uh, Perth, six months in Darwin, and that was at the age of 16, you were saying. So yeah. it's, um, it's you know, it, people always say, oh, you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, but there's a famous Kobe Bryant, I don't know if you follow basketball, but there's a famous yeah, yeah. Kobe Bryant quote uh, that goes, well, you should put all your eggs in one basket. And if that breaks, you just go buy a new basket, right? Like, yeah. and it's, it's kind of sounds like that where it's like you gave it everything you had and you made sure that you were trying to maximize every ounce of your potential, um, uh, you know, to the best you could at that time, right? With what you Yeah, know. yeah, I, um, absolutely. And, and I, 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 I'm a believer in the Kobe mentality. I think that you've got a short span. If, if professional sport or, or like you want to be a, a, a great, you want to be excellent at something, you've got a short window and then the, the window closes and you can't do it. Like if you want to be a professional cricketer, you might have at, at the most till you're 24 or 25. And then you've got another 70 years where you can go and build a new basket or find something else. So right. I think you need to be all in. I think you need to be fully committed. That doesn't mean it's 24 seven and it consumes right. your life. You need to have like go and hang out with your mates. You need to go and watch movies. You need to go and do other things to get away from it, but you need to be, all in in what you're going after if you're half in well there'll be people that are all in sort of like i was i guess that that do over like pass you and get to where you want to be so 
look, there'll be a lot of people that listen. Well, there'll be people that listen to this, and a lot of people that sort of subscribe to the all-in mentality and don't make it, and they feel let down or they feel disappointed. But I think that they're the people that can live with no regrets. They can say, "Yeah, I had Absolutely. a crack, and I didn't. I wasn't good enough, and for whatever reason, whether it was." I didn't have the right people around me. I didn't have the right support when I was young or the right information. I was in bad habits or whatever it is. But the people that go half-heartedly and never go all in, they're the ones that go, they're the ones that become bitter and go, oh, I wish, mm. I wish I'd tried or that kid was, I was better than him. But, okay, well, he's gone further than you because he was all in. So um, I think, yeah, like I think you, you can't come back, and I say this a lot, you can't come back and try and be a pro in any sport at 40 or 45 or 60 but you can play professional sport or try and play professional sport, not make it at 26, go to university. And by your 35, you've got a, a, a thriving back career. On track, yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. so I, I, I certainly believe in the Kobe mentality. And then yeah, I'm a big fan of Kobe. I use a lot of his content. I think he's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You're gone too soon. <laughs> um, so I guess switching gears, what led you then, uh, you know, having represented Middlesex, uh, to start cricket mentoring, um, how did you transition to that? I guess um, from yep. going from playing pro to coaching. Yeah, so twenty twelve was my last year with Middlesex. I came back to per- I, I met my now wife at the start of that summer in England. We spent seven months together, and we I came back to Perth. She stayed in the UK, and I planned. I said, look, I'll come back next season. We did long distance for six months. I went back to England for sort of two thousand and thirteen to be with her fundamentally, and. I had the opportunity, I guess, I'd gone from Middlesex, which was a one of the largest, biggest, sort of best counties, and I could have potentially gone to a smaller county and tried, but I was sort of still ambitious to play for Western Australia and Australia, and I'd come off, when I lost my contract with Middlesex, I'd come off my best ever season in Perth. I'd scored the most runs in the competition, and I'd played one game for the Western Australia second eleven. So... I was really ambitious. I wasn't thinking about England anymore. I was thinking, I want to live in Australia. I want to be in Australia. So my wife, my now wife, ended up moving over. And in that that first winter I had with no cricket, 2014, I'd played cricket in the winter. In 2004, I didn't play in 2005 because I was finishing school. But then 2006 to 2013, I played every winter. So this was 2014 was my first winter with no. And I found that I had all this time. I was like, what? I'm not training. What do, what do I do? So... It coincided with us moving into a different part of Perth. Um, I was going. I was thinking I want to get into some coaching, and one of my old team captains, who was a friend, a good friend, he um, he owned a cricket shop that had nets in it in the area we'd just moved into, quite close to where we just moved into. And I, at night one of moving into this new place, I went for a run along the river, and I ran into him, and I said to him, "Oh, I've been meaning to contact you. I want to get into some coaching." And so. Basically, they passed on my number. They had a lot of people coming in and asking about coaching, and they passed on my number to a, the first client. The next week, I did my first session, and they passed on my number to the next client. The next week, I did two sessions. And uh, pretty quickly, I ended up sort of having six or eight sessions a week on top of having a full-time job. And it started with me. Initially, I just wanted to get a bit of extra income and fill mm-hmm. some time. But for the moment... I did my, and I'd done coaching before. Growing up, I'd been a tennis coach when I was sort of in high school for little kids. I'd done coaching in the UK when I was an overseas player, and I never loved it. It was just there to do and earn a bit of money. But that first session I walked in in 2014, I met this 13 year old boy. I will never forget the him being so excited when I like made a little change to his grip or fixed his head or (laughs) said something, and he like got and he hit the ball well, and he got so excited. It gave me this real buzz, gave me this real excitement, and I got. I got quite addicted. I, I got like, I walked out of that first and gone, how good is this? How good? I can yeah. actually know a fair bit about what I'm doing. I think in the past, I, I didn't know what I was doing. So I think I got to this point, I was 25 or 26 or whatever I was, and I'd had some excellent coaching um, by a batting coach at Middlesex and some other people. I'd played professionally, had a bit of credibility. And so I was, I was thought I was, I was, I could offer these people something. So yeah, from what sort of started as a bit of like oh, a bit of extra money while on top of my job, I do it after hours. I, I started to really, really enjoy it from that first session. And I, my clients built pretty quickly. Um, and from day one, I was like, I want to help knowing what I had learned from my career and my shortcomings around my mindset and other things. I was wanting to help these young players um, with their with their holistic cricket not just with their technique not just get your shoulder into the ball more or fix your grip right. it was more like 
So I was printing off articles. This is sort of as early days of social media, I guess. I was printing off articles and getting like giving them folders and like trying to give them all these things that I think could help them. So, <coughs> excuse me. And then 18 months later, um, so that was mid, sort of July 2014, I think. 18 months later, um, I decided I was going to found the business because I had um, a number of my mates were saying, get me some coaching, get me some coaching. Um, and also I, I was sort of wanting to take it to another level. So January 2016, I, I sort of founded Cricket Mentoring, but I didn't really launch the name and the brand and the business till August 2016 um, because we were building the website in the background with my brother-in-law. And in hindsight, I should have done it much earlier, but I was I sort of built 20 pages and wanted them all to be perfect. I was very nervous about putting myself out to the world. I, I sort of a bit like coaching 13 year olds. I was like, yeah, cool. I can do this. I love this. But saying to the world, I'm a coach. I'm, I know what I'm talking right. about. This is my business. This is my brand. I was pretty hesitant and, and nervous. Um, a bit of imposter syndrome. So, um, we launched in August sort of 2016 and then fast forwarding July, 2017, I was able to quit my full-time job and go full-time into it and haven't looked back. Um, so it was all born out of at the start, um, really enjoying and getting a buzz from working in with one-on-one -on -one with players, seeing them develop. And then over the 18 months, it just grew and it was getting, I was loving it. Um, and I was really enjoying helping players sort of, yeah, really understand their mindset and me doing a lot of learning. I was listening to a lot of podcasts. I was reading a lot of books. I was um, sort of having conversations with really good players and trying to learn like, why wasn't I successful? Why are these other players successful? I haven't had the ability. And then, yeah, trying to take those lessons that I, I'd have conversations with Chris Rogers, who's played for Australia and one of my best mates. And I'd take the conversation, I'd get out of the car. I'd just been speaking to him and I'd pass on information to the kid. And I, I was really lucky that I had this great network of people. Adam Voges was a teammate and a friend who just played for Australia, Sean Marsh. And, and I could have conversations and pass on information that other kids weren't getting access to. So yeah, I guess it was, and, and sort of it, the, the tagline of the business is more than coaching and, and the mm -hmm. sort of the, the idea that the business is built around is I'm trying to be the mentor I wish I had. So I'm really, yeah. I get out of bed every day, excited to sort of help people all over the world and, and, and sort of nearly seven years on from the launch or, or um, nine years on from when I started, I, I feel like I still have the same passion for helping these these young aspiring cricketers around the world. That's awesome. So what, I guess at what point did you decide that, hey, it, it might be important, you know, it might be not just beneficial for the business, but like to get this content out into the world because you are, you know, and you're doing all these coaching sessions with, with kids and there's learnings to be shared with a broader audience, right? Um, yeah. how, how did you come to that? realization because I, I i've i've as you mentioned like you were trying to print out articles since 2000 whenever five i remember going online finding chapelway.com and all these different websites and resources um but it wasn't until like uh youtube and i started seeing the content where um you know for your content specifically where there was it was centered on coaching but it was delivered in a way in a bite-sized manner at times um that was easily digestible Right. So uh, w where did you come to that? Uh, how did you come to that? Well, I think so. When when I finished professionally, I came back to Perth in that sort of end of 2000, September 2012. And I had an admin job and I was spending a lot of time at a desk in front of the computer um, thinking just a lot of time to think. And I was spending a lot of time on social media and I was doing a lot of reading and research and following a few people on Instagram and other sort of channels, YouTube or whatever who had online businesses and I love to travel. I love to meet people and experience things. And I think we, we only get one life. I want to sort of live a rich sort of exciting life, I guess. And um, so I was ambitious to sort of make a online business. And so I think I was just curious about how do you do that? How do you, how do you make this thing sort of where you can go anywhere and open your laptop and, and work and, and whatever. So the, the people I was following, and, and Gary Vaynerchuk's been really sort of prevalent as someone, New York-based entrepreneur, mm -hmm. who I was, yeah, really following a lot. And he was sort of in, in this game a lot earlier than me, and I was following him and a few others, and they were saying just sort of put stuff out there, put stuff out there. Yeah. People, if, you, if you're if you authentic and you, you, like, you know what you're talking about, people will, will come. And in those early days, like we launched Cricket Mentoring on the 2nd of August. I think our first Instagram post was on the 6th of August or something. And, 
for the first few months, I was just sharing quotes of players, like quotes around their mindset or their game plan or preparation or just of players. I never had put myself out there. Um, so that's where we started. And then um, I sort of was getting encouraged by my, my mates and my closest mates and my wife and whoever else about like, yeah, go after it, like do it, blah, blah, blah. So I started putting content on YouTube and then I, I ended up one of the, one of the big reasons I wanted to quit my full-time job was so that I could start vlogging and initially in the early days I was writing articles but it was like not my face it was my name on the article but I could sort of put it out there and like not be in front of the camera or anything but yeah and I think it's important to uh, like say that I was pretty pretty hopeless in front of the camera camera early days I was I was trying to memorize things and trying to be perfect and I realized after a while that you just can't be when you're in front of the camera you're going to make mistakes and the more genuine and authentic you are and more off the cuff and not sort of scripted the, the better the, and the more engaging it is, the more sort of relatable it is. So, um, yeah, I guess it was just a, a good combination of things. No one was really sharing high-quality cricket content. Excuse me, a little tickle in my throat tonight. Um, <coughs> so I was, uh, yeah, I just think it was a really good sort of mashing of, of worlds where I was ex-pro, coaching in person, following online people, talking about online business and seeing that there was a space in the, the sort of cricket coaching. So I just put it all together, really. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty awesome. I think, yeah, as a, as, you know, as I mentioned, someone who consumes a lot of cricket content, it, it was one of the earlier videos or like earlier coaching sessions that I had seen. Now, obviously, there's a ton. And, you know, part of what we're trying to do at Pro Tip is to surface up the ones that that are really helpful and and putting out the great content, right? So, uh, yeah, awesome. Um, I know I know we've gone uh, <laughs> a bit on the intro. I did want to get into like the competition section and the coaching philosophy and things like that. So, um, we'll switch gears a little bit here. And um, I guess now that you've started coaching, or uh, in 2016 you started coaching uh, your students. Were you um, specifically coaching uh, in the off season or during season as well for these? for these kids? No, I think it. so I started in July that year in 2014 and then it sort of built into the season and it got busier in the okay. season. And, and, but then <clears throat> a couple of years into it, my busiest month, I was tracking all my sessions. My busiest month was May, like two months after the season had ended. Um, <clears throat> I had this, I was lucky to have this indoor facility. So weather and getting dark early didn't matter. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I was fascinated that like May, was my busiest month in that calendar year. Um, so it's it's an all-year-round thing now. Like kids are, are sort of doing it, and I have to sort of tell them, and like you can't pick up a bat for four weeks. Just take a, <laughs> take four weeks off because like a lot of them just want to go all year round, and at some point they may burn out or they will burn out where they just like they just don't want to be there. They just can't be bothered anymore, and that's sort of right. what burnout is, I guess. So, um, yeah, look, it, it's now – an all year round thing um, and we have different training sort of phases or what we focus on differs depending on what time of year it is whether it's competition phase or, or off season um, but a lot of my players are sort of playing in different tournaments or going away like at the moment I've got probably 10 players that I mentor personally who are overseas playing or up in Darwin playing so um, yeah look it, it's it's an all year round game now, but it's, it, yeah, in those early days, it was, it was, um, yeah, started in the summer, started in the winter, grew into the summer, but then it, it very quickly became just as busy in the winter. If you were to identify, I guess, what, um, what are the key points that you emphasize during off season training versus during the season? Um, well, off, so during the season is more about, I see my players generally once a week. And it's about what do you need? What do we need? What problems are you facing? And what do we need to, like, what do we need to solve? What solutions do we, because generally they they will come and they'll say, yeah, I struggle to get spin on the weekend. So then we'll, we'll try and fix that problem because we don't want to keep making the same mistakes. Um, or they might say, look, I just want to get in the contest tonight. I've done a few sort of technical sessions this week. I just want to, like, get ready for the weekend. Um, so I put a lot of onus on the player to, manage their own development. Now, I'm not working with beginners anymore. I'm working with sort of 15-year-olds plus who are all pretty good at what they do and they're, <clears throat> they're pretty understanding of the game and, and their game. And, and so they come to me with what they think they need. And so the first question I always ask is, how are you? 
how's your weekend? What's happening? Like, what do you want to do? Like, and put the onus on them. If they don't know, well, then maybe I'll sort of lead it a bit. But generally, they're pretty good at knowing what they want to do. Out of season or in, in sort of this phase where it's the winter, it's it's more technical development and plus trying new things, trying to grow their game. Like, okay, if they're not sort of very good at they, – they, like I had a player tonight, I, I sort of in my kit, I've just been at coaching and he's a he's quite a nice player, 15, 16-year-old left-hander, opens the batting and, and he can bat – he can bat time. A few times last year, he might have made 60 or 70 for 180 balls, but he doesn't score quick enough. He doesn't have much of a power game. So at the moment, I'm challenging him to expand and have fun and explore. There's no consequence. You don't play for four months. Like, you don't need to worry if you hit balls in the air and you, you spoon him. Like, let's just mm-hmm. explore and have fun. So <clears throat> whereas if I'm throwing him on a Thursday night or a Wednesday night and he's playing on a Saturday, he's going to be more anxious about making mistakes. He's going to That's going to carry into the weekend. So... He wants to either do some technical work or get in the contest and bat like it's a certain scenario or situation. So, yeah, there are differences really where we go a bit deeper into technique. In season, I'm a believer that you've got to manage your technique all year round. I don't I don't subscribe to the sort of thought that, oh, it's the, it's the season. We're not going to talk about technique. Let's just leave it over there. That's taboo. That's scary because you'll get clouded. Like you've got to manage your technique. So we do a lot of basics. And so I, I, I do 45-minute sessions um in person um and when we're doing technical like we're doing physical stuff i do a lot of online stuff around the mindset and whatever but when we're doing physical it's it often will be like a 10 or 15 minute underarm getting your basics getting your fundamentals what i call your your daily vitamins then maybe we get into the contest or we do spin or we do something else sometimes it will just be all contests it'll be all sort of bit of bowling machine to work on in swing and head not falling over but Everything has a purpose. You know, I find it interesting that you mentioned you have to manage your technique and not uh, necessarily fix your technique because um, a lot of times, especially growing up, coaches would try to find every single technical flaw, um, especially, you know, in 2005 or whatever. I had coaches that subscribed from the 80s uh, mindset of, oh, your back lift's coming from, uh, you know, uh, second slip and, you know, you're, 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 grip is too rounded, whatever it might be. And it's, it's a, it, even watching your videos, I noticed that there are times when you are speaking to your students about them understanding their own game and understanding their pros and cons, right? Like of what their strengths and weaknesses are. So I like this term managing your technique rather than, you know, fixing your technique all the time. Yeah. yeah. Look, I I think, and I, it's, it's not my term. I think it's somewhere, it's something I've got somewhere like might be off Chris Rogers. He's someone I speak to every day, pretty much about cricket and batting. And, but it's just about like, we're in the batting technique is what I work on. I don't do any bowling coaching. It's, it's it's a never ending journey. Like we're always managing it with what we've got. We're always problem solving. We fix one thing. Another problem comes up. We fix that problem. Another one comes up or, What's, we've got five problems. What's the biggest one that we need to solve now to try and get some success both in the short term but also in the long term? Yeah. So it's it's a whole management. <clears throat> and the same goes with mindset. You've got to manage your thoughts. You've got to focus, like manage your focus and, and your attention. So it's not ever trying to, like, to me, fix it like is like a, a um, there's a conclusion. But, but to this, there's no conclusion. It's just ongoing until the day we retire, like, I'm no longer playing, so I'm not having to manage my technique. But up until the sort of two years ago when I was playing, I was just managing little things, trying to keep my head still and whatever. So it's just trying to stay on top of – I was fortunate to train with Adam Voges at the end of his career. He p- was playing for Australia. Um, he'd averaged 60 in test cricket, and, and he was managing little things in his game. He wasn't <laughs> sort of fixing big errors, but he was trying to manage little things that he'd always had to manage. So it never goes away no matter how good you get. <clears throat> awesome. Um, I guess – Switching to in season a little bit, how do you know when someone is is game ready? Like whether that's mentally or like in a good headspace um, when you're working well, with your students. Yeah, it's, I don't think I I don't think I can ever know because I think people are really good at faking it. Um, sure. But <clears throat> I can get a sense, but I'll never know for sure. But I think that there's times when we're never ready. There's times when we might mm. feel ready, but we're not. So I think it's about trying to bring our best with whatever we've got in that moment. So I don't think like being ready is a, is a be all and end all thing. I think it's a sure. Right. Where am I coming from? Like I come coming off two ducks. What do I, like, well, how do I need to prepare this week to be as ready as I can and leave that baggage behind? Or I'm coming off lots of runs. I'm like, I've got to still leave that behind and be start again. So 
everyone's got sort of thoughts and emotions and, and here in Australia, especially we don't, we like in, in the UK, they play a lot of cricket in the summer in Australia. It's generally just on the weekend. So you've got a lot of time to sort of sit with your thoughts and, and sort of often yeah. dwell on what's happened. So <clears throat> look, it's, I, I do my best to try and help them let go of what's happened and refocus on the here and the now and what's ahead and then just, be as ready. And, and for me, I'm, I'm ultra positive. Like it's, okay, you got a duck, so what? Everyone gets a duck. You're not hitting them well, that's yeah. okay. Game's on the weekend. Don't worry about it. Like it's trying to, yeah. like most people are their own harshest critics. So I'm trying to be that sort of positive voice that's like, no, nah, you're ready. All good. If you get a duck, so what? It's just a game. Play on, we go again next week. So <clears throat> like one of my big sort of, I guess, philosophies is that no one innings is the going to make or break your career. Like it's it's what you do over a career or over a season or a couple of seasons that's going to push you to where you want to get to. So it's it's sort of trying to take away this this idea that so many players have that this is the most important game I'm ever going to play. And then with that idea, they get tense and anxious and that sort of yeah. causes them to not play at their best. So, um, yeah, it's just trying to like let them relax and enjoy it more. The more we can be relaxed and enjoy it and be present, well, that's where we can bring our best. So, look, it's an interesting question. I just don't think <clears throat> players are ever ready. Yeah. It's just it's just trying to bring the the best of what you've got in that moment. <clears throat> yeah, and I guess whether you're ready or not, the weekend's coming and you have to play the game. So you, exactly. you, you just got to figure it out. When you you're can't there, choose but... and say, "No, I'm not ready. I'm not going to play." Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, I but I guess to that point, if you notice that someone you know is is struggling to calm their nerves or or you know gets butterflies and are they've come with uh, come up with that or do you have any techniques that you prescribe to them or like how do you get them to find what works for them um yeah as a well, mentor or a coach? Yeah. we had um we had a sports psychologist on our podcast a few years ago and it's cricket australia sports psychologist and he said that when we i asked him that question from a psychology point of view um mm -hmm. he said the first thing to do is normalize it and say man it's normal. And so the the biggest thing I do is just say to them, hey, look, you can't see other people's nerves. Unless someone's wetting their pants or they're trembling, you can't really see that they are shitting themselves or that their legs feel heavy. We right. feel it internally in our own body, but we look around and everyone's smiling or like sitting back looking cool. The other 21 people in the game look like they've got their shit together. But internally, they're all going through it as well. And some more than others, but if you put sort of a lot of 13-year-olds together, most of them are on a similar scale. But if you put a lot of adults together, there'll be some who have played a lot of cricket or whatever and they're more relaxed. There'll be some that are really trying hard because someone's watching, so they'll be more tense. So the scale will change a bit more. But generally in a big game, everyone has some sort of form of nerves. And so it's just saying, man, like it's normal. Like, And guess what? You can still do well. Like it's not... Mm -hmm. It's not we have to look at it as a bad thing. This is your body giving you energy. This is your body sort of saying it's it's heightening your senses. So I, I normalize it. I try and flip the story that it's a good thing. And then I share often share an, a, per, a personal story. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> no where like I talk about how when I got nervous, I often played at my best because yeah. it was because it heightened my senses, it heightened my focus. Yeah. So instead of. Some days I wasn't nervous. I'd be a bit lethargic and a bit slow. I'd actually get nerves and butterflies, and I'd be like, oh, yes, okay, cool. This is like, this means I want it. This means I care. This means I'm going to go well today. To that point, in terms of normalizing butterflies, you know, one of, one of our philosophies is also that everyone goes through good days and bad days. And, and, what what's the most important thing is to learn from your bad days, right? And actually learn from every day, but uh, it, you sometimes get your best learnings from your worst moments, right? And so can you share with us like your worst um, sports performance and, you know, how you bounce back from that? Uh, one, one story that comes to mind, one story where I've just probably never felt as bad or as awful as I have is, I was playing a game for Middlesex. I only played, I think, I don't know, 15 or 20 games, white ball games across my career. And this game was on TV. I'd only played a few games at the time. And Stephen, we were, field, we were fielding. And Stephen Finn played for England, was bowling. Mm -hmm. Ravi Bapara was batting. <clears throat> and I'm fielding at Deep Square League under lights. And it's a TV game. So Michael Holding and some great players are in the commentary box. And 
Finn bowls a ball to the opponent and he hits it top edge and I'm on the boundary and I run in. Pretty straightforward catch, but under lights, you lose that depth perception. Mm-hmm. And I'd never really, I'd never had a lot of experience playing under lights. And so I sort of ran in and I thought the ball was about a metre from me, but it hit my hands and I dropped it. Anyway, where it's about the sixth over of a 40 over game. So for the next 35 overs, I was on the boundary at Chelmsford in Essex and the crowd's about this far from you, from the boundary. <laughs> And they were, it was like we were away at Essex and they were spraying me for 35 overs. And I have never wanted to not be at a cricket field more than then. It was on TV. I was just, my mind was racing. I didn't understand how to manage my thoughts, how to sort of re sort of forgive myself, move on and get present. And every time the ball came to me, I was this nervous wreck. And I don't think I made too many other mistakes, fortunately, that night, but it was an awful, awful feeling, and, and I sort of can, can recall it really vividly. Um, but, yeah, I guess, like like you say, like every single person has bad days, and I, I got plenty of ducks in my career. I played over 200 first-grade games here in Perth, and I got <clears throat> I had some good days. I, has, I scored 10 hundreds, but that's not a great strike rate in 200 games, and I was able to get 100 in a final at the Wacker, but most of the time I didn't succeed, like, I had, and, and as you say, like I tried to learn from my good days and, and get clues. I think there's the, the great saying that I use, use a lot is success leads clues. But the bad days, the tough days is where you learn a lot about yourself as well. Um, yeah. And that's one thing I try and preach to my players and teach to the athletes I work with is you had a bad day. Cool. That's normal. Everyone has a bad day. You had a bad year. That's okay. Virat Kohli didn't score a century for three years in international cricket. Steve Smith was two and a half years like Joe Root. Had a couple of years. And then what they do is when they are in form or they're going well, they make it count. They really cash in and make it a purple patch really good. So so don't fear the bad days. They're normal. They're part of it. It's it's making the good days really good days. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, and, and, and it's it's funny because, like, it's never as bad as you think it is, right? Internally, you take a mistake and you take – uh something that went wrong and you feel like that's the absolute worst thing that could have ever happened in your life. And you blow this up to be this big thing. And then you carry it into the next game. And, you know, that's kind of what my experience has been where, you know, similarly drop a catch and then all of a sudden you're thinking about it, you drop another one and then it just compounds. Right. But yeah. And that's, to and, and, that's those. and that's where yeah. I think, <clears throat> that's where I think like some of my best work is just saying to them, that's okay. No worries. I did it. I'm okay. Like move on. Like, but yeah. I never had that person just have that conversation. With it can yeah. be a ten, can be a thirty second conversation that changes things for them. It's like, yeah, you, you got a duck. Don't worry about it. Let's train and we go again this week. Or like, whereas I would have yeah. been like, I got a duck. Oh, I suck. I'm hopeless. So it's like, yeah, it's trying to normalize that. Yeah, what you're going through is actually normal. And the best players just keep showing up. Yeah, and I think I think that's kind of the the, the secret. Or like the reason it your videos and your coaching has resonated so well with me is back when I was growing up, it was more through more along the lines of, oh, you have butterflies, power through it, right? But it's not, you can't just power through what you're feeling and fake it as if it's okay. Like you have it's to re- there, like yeah. real internally realize that it's okay. Not just, oh, I'm just going to push through it because then that doesn't Pretend work. Pretend it's not right? there. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 